back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And my next guest is a critically acclaimed writer and director, best known for co-writing and directing the seminal lesbian film Go Fish, starring our very own Guinevere Turner, as well as writing, directing, and co-executive producing all six seasons of The L Word. What, you're correcting me on something? Yeah. Was there one year you didn't do it? A one, two, and then and then six. Those are the ones you did? Yeah. Sam. I directed five in season five. Mm-hmm. I left in season three. So three and four, <gasps> I wasn't. No, I didn't. I can't say it on, on air. Oh, no. Okay. okay. Yeah. We're going to. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, I walked away from my contract, but yes. Okay. We're, this is already getting more interesting (laughs) than I thought. Okay. Long story short. Hi, Rose Trichet. Hi. Hi. How are you? I am good. I'm good. How are you? Well, so we met last night because, so New Fest, which is the gay and lesbian, you know, New York film festival, similar to like Outfest in LA and Frameline in San Francisco. So it's the 30th anniversary of Go Fish. Yes. And of course, there's the New Fest Film Festival, but they also have programming throughout the year. And, to, yeah. and so to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Go Fish, you worked on a restoration of the original film, putting it in 4K, which that I don't, I have no idea what that means. Yeah. But it did look better. Yes. <laughs> So what does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to sort of restore, revitalize a film? Is It really depends on your budget, right? We didn't have, we got money from UCLA. We got money from the Motion, Motion Picture Academy, from MGM Amazon, from Sundance. These forces came together to kind of, kind of just... Let's let's just say give the film a little facelift. And so just like a facelift, you can afford a really expensive one uh, where no one sees the scars and you can afford one where, you know, like... You know, it's but so anyway. What, so, what was, four, so if so, we did the 4K restoration. Do we? So did we see the scars? No, the 4K just means that it's a digital. It's a it's a, a digital version of of the okay. film, right? And and so what it means is that the original input of the negative of the 16 mil negative was inputted into you know was inputted digitally, and so and so it's just like films now that are shot on film will usually be sort of done in post-production and edited in digital, in a di- digital medium. And so we are now at 4K, which of course is not the highest K. In, in what's, the the high, what's the highest oh K? Oh my God. Um, by the time this comes out, it might be, I mean, there's like eight, I mean, most TVs are like eight, you know, or six, okay. like there's, there's a lot of Ks now. Wow. So I many gotta K- double check my facts so there. I feel K's. like I should have my phone and, and double check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But 4K is like, but, but it, it's sort of the standard for a lot of TVs. Um, still, but it does give it a facelift. You're, we were able to kind of, you know, color correct. And you say, how do you color correct a black and white film? Well, it's it's we it's usually like a contrast level. Like if you're you know make a black and white photo on your phone and you want to, you know, zhuzh it around. Um, so we were able to do that. Do some stabilizations. Do some cleanups to sound. Um, you know, but like we weren't able to dehairify it, like, for example, because <laughs> right. yes, that would mentioned- take a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that it was so yes. the event last night was so great. There was yeah. like a pre a, a, before the so this was at BAM, the BAM yeah. Theater, Brooklyn, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brooklyn Academy of Music. Yeah. Yeah. At the theater, and prior to that, there was a little reception where yeah. I ran into between four and six people I know from Fire Island. Uh, at the- that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so that was really nice to yeah. like, run into people that I knew. And you would like going- donors and board members, I think, and people involved in New Fest. Just, you know, with that reception. The gays. Yeah. 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 And you, of course, you and Gwynevere were there. Yes. And it was my first time ever seeing the two of you together in oh. person. You guys still have really great, great chemistry. You're oh, very fun funny. together. Yeah. Like part of me was like, because of course I've interviewed Guinevere in the past, yeah. but part of me was like, oh, it'd be really fun to do them together. Then I had the whole mental of like, oh, but does that down, does that now water down the rose segment? So we're yes, it does. It, anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, yeah, yes, we do have a, we do certainly we've no, I mean, come on, we've known each other for like 35 years it's like you know you you get a banter plus we've just you know i mean go fish brought us out into the world you know what i mean as public figures yeah yes like we went to a lot of countries that's when independent film was still like you would travel to 16 countries you know would go to a bunch of film fests you know like people would bring you out because the at that time like directors were the stars right and Mm -hmm. guinevere always as as the star of the movie did all that traveling as well and so, you know, now it's a little bit different, you know. So 
but a, m- a lot of money was put into that kind of promoting the film with with part of the talent of the film. You two met in Chicago. Mm-hmm. You were in film school. Yes. What was Guinevere doing at the time you met? How do you say uh, unemployment? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, she was temping. <laughs> She, I remember because she used to work a temp job, and I used to be like, "Ooh, the outfits!" Um, but uh, 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 you know, like the, the the still the stockings in the outfit. But she was she had recently graduated from Sarah Lawrence. They, um, her and her friend Luke had moved to Chicago. I don't know what brought them to Chicago. I forget kind of what it was. It theater or was it something? But you know, I mean, I think Guinevere's. I don't want to speak for her too much, but I, but I'm pretty sure at the time her aspiration was to be a writer. Uh, a novelist. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, and I was kind of, I had, I really had like one of those dreams of being in a romantic relationship, which was also a partnership, which was also a creative partnership. Um, and so I sort of, I think I, I really imposed that upon our relationship and had a willing partner in it. You know what I mean? And she was a writer and a writer whose writing I really loved. Um, so it just made complete sense. And- did, did you meet at ACT UP? Or is that something that you did together once you were hanging out? That's where we met. Uh, I think we met at Queer Nation, and you know, you sit around in a, in a, you know, in a circle. It was kind of our Tinder of the time. You know what I mean? A little bit. You know, we were all like committed to the cause. I never did. I don't. Did I do an action with Guinevere? Maybe I did. Maybe we went to the CDC. Like we would do actions, right? We would go to CDC and like protest, or go to San Francisco and do, you know, a um, a, a sit-in somewhere. Or we had we had plenty of stuff in Chicago, like you know, like the Cook County Hospital of Chicago had segregated areas where they would have men who had the definition. CDC had to find AIDS in men, how it manifested itself, but not for women. So women weren't meeting the they, they weren't being diagnosed with. AIDS, right? They were like HIV positive, but not diagnosed with AIDS, yet they were dying because it manifested in women differently. So we fought for those things. We fought for to not be so segregated and, you know, like kind of just people put into like some kind of, you know, leper colony. Yes, especially if they were ostracized from their families. Right. Fighting for drugs, you know, uh, access to drugs and just fighting for like, can we do some research, please? Because it really took a long time uh, coming. But it it was so funny because someone sent me a picture a scout who was there last night sent me a pic- sent me a, a picture of the four of us together, which is hilarious because we were. I was just like, oh my god, it's so lesbian because it's the four of us. It's Scout VS who was Scout's girlfriend at the time. We all had met. So VS Guinevere, Scout and I used to go to Queer Nation. We weren't together anymore. We had bre- we had been broken up, but we had stayed roommates. And then we sort of just were like kind of swooped in on these two people like, who are you? You know, like, like kind of like, you know, kind of I, I almost remember us doing a like, who are you going to go for? What is that? You know, of the you know, because like we were inter- we were both interested in both of them. Uh, but then we ended up, you know, it's just like hilarious. Just so like, that's that's kind of the four of us back in the day. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, this photo. Guinevere looks three years old. Oh, yeah, that's like right out of that's kind of right out of Sarah Lawrence, which is a very different Guinevere than the Guinevere you see now. That particular version of Guinevere sort of sort of came out of uh, almost towards the end of Go Fish. That was after we broke up. This was kind of the Guinevere that I was with, Um, which is interesting to say that. But, you know, everyone goes through their it's almost like into adulthood. It was still like kind of Sarah Lawrence Guinevere that I that I dated, you know, that I had a relationship with. And then there became the professional, the, you know, the actor Guinevere, the writer Guinevere. Yeah, yeah. it's the uh, the child star is they, you know, help yeah. uh, Hannah Montana into Miley Cyrus. Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Which, you know, I, I have secretly watched since Hannah Montana. <laughs> now, I know, so now you and Guinevere do have differing origin stories of Go, of Go Fish. No, like of oh, how the... Oh, yes. Yes, it's So it's I know annoying. that your, your story, so tell me what's true and what is fan fiction here. Yes. Something about you had seen the movie Switch, which I remember. Yes, she she is really um, the the thing about Guinevere is Guinevere is a really amazing storyteller. She is also um, someone who journals and and that on its face would make her a reliable narrator. But, you know, there's other mitigating factors that 
you know, poke holes in that a little bit. Switch did come up, but I think for her it was more than, I'm sure I was outraged um, as well. The whole, uh, the whole thing with Switch, this is the film right. with Ellen Barkin, which it's so crazy because I think I saw this, I, I either saw it in the theater or it was something that maybe I saw it on VHS, but it was definitely something that I understood to be a gay thing that in, wasn't how Go Fish started. No, it I know. It wasn't but, as a reaction to Switch. But I, but in my little yeah. 1991 yeah, yeah. Yeah, brain yeah. as a little kid, I understood, oh, there's something to do with like switching genders. There's yeah. something There's something of the gay nature, even yeah. though I didn't even have that language, even though yeah. I was barely 10 years old. Yeah. The thing with Switch, how this is the inciting incident for Guinevere is there's a scene in that movie in which Ellen Barkin, who's now a woman goes to a lesbian bar and the two of you are watching in this movie and are outraged or she's outraged at like, this is not the way we, we, uh, we see lesbian bars in Chicago. And I think we were like, that's bullshit. And then over the years it's turned to, you know, because the, the process of storytelling, especially telling a story over and over again is you polish it and polish it. And you, it's like telling our own origin stories, right? Like, myself my parents who came from Puerto Rico you know like all those things get get honed and so it's been 30 years of polishing you know there's a so lot give me, of so give me your version I was in film school I wanted to make you know like I was ready I, I thought experimental filmmaking was like the the shit I was like I'm, I'm like you know this is like what I do I'm an artist I also was in a relationship with somebody that I wanted to lock down let's just say it like that you know I, I wanted to um I was excited about my relationship with Guinevere. I think I really wanted, I'm like, oh my God, I've now it's like, this is perfect. I'm like, we're going to, we can stay together and be partners in this. And I could have my like dream, my artist dream of having, you know, a partner that I work with. So we had, we ventured out into a narrative that I think, I think I wrote, but Guinevere was in. I wish I could find it because it's horrifying and it's so oh, hilarious. Is, is this the sh- how it started as a short? Yeah, I had made experimental shorts, and then my first narrative short was was a real. Uh, it had nothing to do with Go Fish. It was like this kind of like I don't even know. I probably put all my issues into it, and then Guinevere was in it. We had shot it in this little uh, a, a coach house that we lived in, and you know, and it was just funny. I have, I actually have some tapes from around that time. Scout, I live with Scout, and VS was like seeing Scout. You know, like it was like kind of the four of us. VS Brody for people. Yes. VS Brody is Guinevere's co-star, the co-lead yes. in Ghost in Go Eli. Fish. Yeah, yeah, and. You know, we made that first one. I edited it. I don't think I worked on it very deeply because it, there was not, it was not like that salvageable. I remember going in and showing it to my class. My film teacher, on Shaw, was like, oh, um, well, you know, when you have a camera angle, you should, you know, know why that, you know, because I'd gone <laughs> from experimental filmmaking and then started the process of, of making a short and Go Fish started as a short. And it was just another endeavor in film school. To, to make something which started as a short. And then, and then I had, I saw Poison, Todd Haynes's Poison, which for me was so, I think Christine must have been there. Todd was certainly there. It was at the Chicago Theater, the Chicago Fine Arts Theater. And I, that was where I used to like kind of cut school and go to and like, you know, really wanted to really be a filmmaker. And it just, that movie spoke to me so hard. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it in three. And of course I just ripped it off. You know, I'm going to do it in three parts. And, we and the, just, the three parts of Go Fish, mm-hmm. how would you explain the three parts? Air, experimental, narrative, and doc. And so the experimental and narrative stayed. And the doc But the gone. doc went away, yeah. When Christine Vachon saw, like, I have a proposal. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be on the Blu-ray. It'll be included on the Blu-ray is the, is the reel that I sent to Christine. The reel that I edited. Christine of, like, Vachon, who, like, yes. runs killer films. yes producer of yes. every movie you've ever seen including right. carol who is the reason yeah. why you know go fish exists yeah uh, because i sent out that i sent like i edited a reel and i sent it to like ted hope and to like james sheamus and to like whoever was in the article that b ruby rich wrote about new chris cinema i just highlighted everyone and then i just like hey i'm making a lesbian film <laughs> you know you want to get involved or we were like and uh and then ended up sending that tape and christine was the one person who wrote back and thought there was something there which was amazing because it was like we were really out of money. Um, you did the whole thing for for yourselves. You put eight thousand of your own. No, I think it was like more like seventeen. 17. I had I had worked at University of Illinois. Uh, that's how I worked my way through school, and so I had a I had a like my pen my 
you build your pension. I was in my 20s. I was like, I don't know, 20 something. And uh, so I didn't have much of it there, but I had been working there for since I was like 19. And so I took all my retirement, which was like, I, you know, which I got taxed on obviously heavily. And then that's when I stopped paying taxes for 10 years. But um, oh. yes, yeah, it, it was a real thing. It was one of those things where you would hear about people making films and then destroying their financial, mm -hmm. like kind of, and that was me. I didn't have a bank account for 10 years. I'm like, didn't have, it was not until I was making bedrooms and hallways where I, when I got paid money, but I lived in London. So I opened an account there and then I had to deal with my taxes because we literally would just write a check, know that we didn't have the money. And back then you could write a check at the grocery store, but then you can debit, take your debit card and take money out before it got cut. And then, so we had a, Guinevere and I had a, I think it was like a 10, 10 pages of bounced uh, you know, like it was just on the fridge with a magnet. We took it down when we filmed, obviously, because like where where Max lives with Kia is was our apartment. Of course, yes. Yeah. And uh, that's the apartment that after we broke up, we said, still, you know, I have to keep everything there. But we used to keep it on the fridge like, oh, shit, we're in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, and then like just begging various people for money. And like, you know, uh, she reminded me of one of her cousins who gave money. And then, yeah, but the big a big chunk was that chunk that I got from my whatever you call that, my benefits that I yeah. had at the, at the time that should have rolled right back into another job. And I'm like, I'm taking it and running. Of course. And yeah, uh, yeah. GT had a, had a temp job. The EC, the cup that she's drinking out of was from that company, I remember. And uh, so it's, you know, it's like corporate by day, making this indie film by night. And that's kind of how that was. But I, but Switch wasn't a, you know, it didn't generate. I, we did sit down and say, what is it that we want to see? Um, that is very true. Um, and it might, and it's not untrue that Guinevere, it might've been more of a thing for Guinevere that she like took that and part of the like, general tapestry yes, yes, for her. Like, you know, for me, it was like, you know, I, I, I think I need to make narrative and I think I need to, you know, and I think this is the, the right person to do with. And because you also have to understand that, like I had been in act up and in queer, I had been in, I met Guinevere maybe the second year or something that I was in ACT UP and Queer Nation. And we were all about lesbian visibility at that time because we, we felt like, you know, our male counterparts were literally disappearing and we were sort of disappearing from a conversation, right? Not, not with gay men, but in the world. And so it be became very important for us to have that. So that's what the, that's the reason why so many people worked on the film and worked on it for free and worked on it for such a long time someone asked how many days we shot I know we shot 55 days and when I say days I mean after work or weekends you know mm -hmm. what I mean I know there was at least that and then we went back and did I, I did pickups in Chicago later and you know like because there's various apartments I'm like oh I we were done with our general wrapping I think before and then I did she that had last to go montage. and you had to beg her to continue to do voiceover oh my well yes because you know but it was very very interesting because I had, I moved to New York. I, when we got done, I moved to New York and Guinevere had lived in New York because she went to Sarah Lawrence. And she was like, she swore she would never move here. She stayed in Chicago. And then partway during, during like the edit process, like moved to New York. I remember going like, I really loved her writing style, like not her writing, her, her prose. I really liked her drawing style, right? So I'm like, I'm like, I want you to do one thing. Make me one cell of like, can you do the credits for me? All I need you to do is do, I'm going to give you a, um, a you know, and it, she had to write them down. I'm like, I'm going to get get you a, a light board, you know, and then just do like one and one slightly off. And then what I'll do is just print, you know, like take a shot of one, take a shot of the next, and then you get this little, did it, you know, and the titles. It's only two cards. The title sequence, yes. The title sequence is only animation of two cards, two illustrations per title card. And that one was just like, she's like, you know. Acting as if you're asking her to go into a coal mine. Oh, yeah. And meanwhile, I'm like, I'm like looking for tiny little pieces of 16 mil and like, you know, my God, I was so broke. We were so broke. And, and to answer your other question, yes, Guinevere would be like, what do you want to do? Stick a quarter in me and get a voiceover out? I'm like, if I have to, that is what I would like. Well, the, la the last voice, the, the end of the film, yeah. when she does, that is like the most powerful thing of the entire. And that's the one I asked her to do. Yeah. She definitely like lands... She yeah. sticks the landing. That was there. the last one that I needed to end the film with. And that was like, you know, and, and she's brilliant. So it's like, it's like, you know, you can say like, you know, can you please write a voiceover? And yes, I did make it seem simple. Like I need some more of that, that, that hot writing in this movie. You know what I mean? And I was building this sequence. And of course, I needed the words to create the sequence. You know, I mean, that, and that, that's all that whole ending comes from like experimental filmmaking and like, you know, um, 
but but getting that general sense of like the joy of like finding the person you want to be with or kind of temporarily being with the person that you're attracted to, you know, right. That kind of thing. That's, it's all encompassed in that, in the end of the thing. And those two really VS and, and Guinevere, I think had such a chemistry together. We had known each other. We were the ones who were friends prior. Mm -hmm. And then we would just be like, see someone like a waitress and be like, with Anastasia, for example, who plays Daria. We'd be like, hey, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> We're like, right. she's cute. She's cute. She's got a whole something. She's got a thing, right? Because we used to go to this one restaurant um, called Leo's Lunchroom. And she used to be a waitress at Leo's Lunchroom. And we were just like, and that was literally her style, right? And so we were just like, hmm, I like it. Let's ask her. Let's ask this other cute person. You know, like we were just, we literally, our casting process was about seeing someone and they're just being like would you commit to this there's zero money it will probably go zero places and, and you know would you do it for the love and for hanging out you know right. that 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 was it so it gets into sundance this is where you secure the the rest of the money to finish the film and it and this is also where you famously meet kevin smith and scott Mosier, his producing partner and Go Fish and Clerks were kind of these indie darlings that year of 1994. Yes. And you create, you had like this interesting friendship. Of course. Guinevere know, more than I. When it, well, it, it was really, she explains that it was really Guinevere, that it was herself and Scott. It was really Guinevere and Scott. To, who had which, this entire thing of which Chasing Amy is based on. Which Kevin Smith then right. was right. inspired Turned to by chase, yes. Chasing Amy. Yes, that was their whole um entanglement was something I was not involved with. We had met, we had met Kevin and Scott prior because Kevin and Scott also got funds from John Pearson um, to, to finish his movie, just like he did with ours. So John Pearson was representing both films at Sundance that year. So we have a lot in common, right? Um, he had done finishing funds for that movie. He did finishing funds for ours. And then he went on to sell both of those films at Sundance that year. Ours was sold first. And then Kevin's was sold second. Um, yeah, and those two just kind of stayed. I mean, you know, Kevin and I are, I mean, friendly, you know, when we were like on a panel and whatever, like, you know, we, we started off in this thing together. But yes, Guinevere and Scott had a relationship with that went on. Go Fish went on to gross $2.4 million. More than that? Maybe oh, yeah. at, maybe in its initial run? Yeah, it made uh, it made over... I know world, are you talking North America? Maybe North America. Oh, yeah, because worldwide it was more towards the five. Wow. Yeah. So Go Fish is where you really make your name for yourself. And yes. then you went on. I know you made a name, but no money. You and made Gwen, a name. Guinevere will tell you that, too. Yeah. You made a name, but no money. Yeah. So you go on. You, you, you're in New York. You're trying to figure things out. The first episode of television you would ever direct mm -hmm is six feet under yeah. arguably one of the greatest yeah. television shows ever made yeah. that was a real score so alan ball was the sh he's a creator and showrunner mm. what did you learn from him i learned from him and just that whole experience kind of what would go on to happen everywhere which the writers are the kings in in television alan ball very much treats his writers like they are everything and everyone and, and, and everyone serves the words. That's really the biggest thing that I learned from Six Feet Under. That and working three cameras, you know what I mean? It was like and beautiful and great actors and amazing sets and you know, but the hierarchy, the structure is different, right? Like in film, the director is, you know, King. and I was also yeah. well, I was also the director and the co writer, you know, and like and the you know, the co producer. So I came from a world where I was really that and that adjustment was uh it was interesting and like you know it's it's a different it's a different kind of platform and it still is like you are you are only a director the director is not what the director is in film in television yes it's the showrunner who's usually the writer and the creator of the show is the actors often complain that television is a showrunner's medium it is because we're only there as directors to serve whatever that person is imagining mm -hmm. in their head and a lot of showrunners don't have the experience of directing or you know what it is it's it's like it's they don't have the experience of knowing the the, the the mechanics of making 
right? That if we go outside of the front door on a studio set, we have to go and they're having a fight and they walk outside that we have to go to location to shoot the exterior someplace, for example, for example. So you're just like, you know, that's going to cost us an extra half a day. Oh, do I have to change it? It's like, think about the whole working, you know, so it almost feels like we should come together more or there should be more writer directors, you know what I mean? Right. To bridge the, to bridge the gap that happens and in the, the information gap that happens. I've actually just thought of one final question. Yeah. Just circling quickly back to go fish. Yeah. Now you famously broke up in the middle of production, yeah. which the cast has led, like you or you, the two of you have said that it like wrecked havoc, wreaked yeah. havoc on the cast how so it's not like anybody wanted to be around us i and also why did you break up oh did guinevere tell you this or no well let's hear your version oh come on there's only one version (laughs) we were literally talking about it last night because our friend donna who there were two couples and both couples broke up and these two people got together which was not me was guinevere and the other and the other person from the other couple yeah we were so just so funny because my friend and I were there last last night and we were like the dumped ones, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they got together. Yeah. They got together. I think I was in love with Guinevere in that way that you're in love with someone when you're young. And I think also like I'm a person of color, she's this pretty white woman. I think I felt like I had like a prize that no one else could have, you know what I mean? I feel like I'm in therapy right now. But I think that a lot of that was like and it gave me a kind of a self-worth that happens to people of color with white people. You know what I mean? Where you're just like, oh, my God, look at, you know, I must be worth more. This person. Lo-. And then and so the heartbreak is it runs deeper. It runs to the core of like kind of what you think your self-worth is. Right. Yeah. And I think with Guinevere, I also think I was very much like in love. With, I also had this idea that we would work together and have like, you know what I mean? Like I had built up a, a bit of a fantasy in my mind um, and we had had other things happen. You know, there were other dalliances and things that we'd gotten over. This one was just fully falling in love with somebody else. How long I mean? were you together? Oh, gosh. I don't think I even forget. I don't think we made it. To, were we together two years even? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how young. Yeah. That's how young. Yeah. But it tore me apart. And, you know, Guinevere is a very, um, she's a highly charismatic, witty, you know, as I said, very attractive person and is magnetic and... It's and, and despite the fact that I was done wrong to, no one really seemed to care. You know, it's not like people were just like, poor Rose, let's be on her side. They were like, oh, but Guinevere is really kind of fun to be. You know what I mean? Like, I was just like, you know, so it was uh, it was an interesting, an interesting and, and very growing that whole relationship. And a lot of it was growing through pain. But I mean, I don't think I gr- I've grown as much in any one relationship as that one. But it's just, you know, it's that uniquely positioned relationship where you're just like, where you literally just get your heart broken, you know, and then kind of, unfortunately, I think we don't allow it again. I, I sort of would love to be heartbroken again, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, you never kind of love exactly in the same way that you did that first time because you're like, ooh, the pain, yeah. you know, and so... Yeah, that's specific. I'm sure you in your history you have something like that too. But it's specific. You know what I, I mean? can re- I can relate to yeah, a lot of what you're saying yeah. for sure. So you you wrote and directed the safety of objects. Yeah. Um that starred Patricia Clarkson and Dermot Mulroney, like that yes. you wrote and directed Kristen Stewart's first movie. Kristen Stewart's mm-hmm. first how old was she? She was ten. She turned eleven, I think, while we were making it. Or was she nine turned ten? Anyway, one of those. Pre panic room? Yes, I wrote the letter to David Fincher for her. I was just like, I was just like, and I wrote a letter to David Fincher. I wish I had it. It's probably on some computer somewhere where I was just like, when I was casting for the role of like this role in Safety of Objects, I was thinking of a young Jodie Foster. Oh my God. Which I literally was. I was like, Alice yeah. doesn't live here anymore, right? Mm-hmm. I was just like, that's kind of like how I had modeled that character. And I searched for this kid. I mean, I think that the role that Kristen Stewart played was one that I had, and she was the kid, but I was searching for a real, the real thing. And all these little girls, all these little like Femi girls would come in and their moms would make them turn their hat around because maybe they saw Go Fish and they saw that Max had their, you know, like Mm -hmm. in that movie had their hat turned around. And little Kristen came in and she sat on a stool and she had her legs apart and puka beads on and she was like this. And I'm like, that is it. (laughs) Authentically that thing, you know? That's really funny. It was so funny. And of course, as a as an adult gay person, I was like, you know, um, but, you know, I was, <laughs> then I was like, yeah, right. 
<laughs> it was a journey to get there, but we got yeah, there. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so how how does the pilot? So I know the story is that you had the choice to either direct this lesbian show called Earthlings, and you were also offered another show called what was, The Ranch. What was that other show? I had completed filming on Safety of Objects. It had not been released yet. And that is the, I remember having a private screening for the folks over at, for Alan Ball and Alan Poole and some of the people on Six Feet Under. And they were like, awesome. And they saw Patty Clarkson in that movie, which saw Patty Clarkson got cast in Six Feet Under as her mm. sister, as the, as the mom's sister. And, and they were like, oh, this, this feels like this. And then I, that's how I got that job because I hadn't done TV before. And then what was really hilarious is that is that I had done Six Feet Under, then then almost like I don't even know how much later than that, I got offered not too not too far in the future. I got these two pilots offered to me, both by Showtime. One was prostitution and the other ones was lesbians in LA or prostitutes in Nevada. And I was like, What has what has like legs? You know what I mean? As we say, you know, what has like longevity? What has a season two, three, four? And I was just like as much as I hate to do another lesbian thing, because I was just like, I don't want to just be the lesbian director. Little did I know at the time that like, you know, just put your eggs in that basket. It's totally fine. And, you know, I was just like, I chose to do the, the, the lesbians, which I'm extremely happy about because it felt like this. It, I was just talking to Kate Medig the other day and I'm like, you know, it's like when you're in it, you don't know. It's like a rela- any relationship. When you're in it, sometimes you don't know how beautiful and wonderful and amazing it is right we all like to complain for all the little things we complained about or whatever but it was just you know a really amazing experience and it felt a lot like go fish Mm. a little bit because we were all committed in the same way to creating a show about friendship to be creating a show about that that really was about identity even though it's like a life that a lot of people don't have because like you know you fail upward at the in the all word you have really nice clothes even though you're broke you know like there's a lot of like you fail a, upward yes yes, yes. i mean yeah. bet all bet did was fail upward <laughs> she's just like she like gets fired and they're like bet um hello this is the president um would you like you know to run you know be the vice president yeah and just like it was like an aspirational world for women which is why I think women watched it, not just not just queer women. I had interviewed Jamie Babbitt yeah. about, about all the things that she's directed, and she was explaining how directing a pilot, how you get paid a lot more money to direct a pilot because it sets the tone for the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. And in particular, within the pilot, the first 15 minutes are crucial. Mm-hmm. to hooking the audience mm-hmm. to even like continue the series mm-hmm. oh i think in any pilot or any feature that is that it's essential that that's that that's there and yes you do you get more time we get paid more because we get we become well for jamie she'd always be the ep if she does the pilot at this point in her career um which has a very prolific career you are yes you're setting the look of the show you're helping to cast the show you're you have more days to shoot Right. So you're kind of making, especially how it used to work um, and still it'll work like, you know, so you're, you're compensated more. Also, you will become a producer of sorts in some kind of way, no, no matter. I mean, depending on what your tier is, what, what you know, how you're coming in. Is it a co-EP? Is it an EP? Uh, and then you're given a, a, a that credit in as long as the show goes on. Who did you help cast or who did you at least like fight for to, ca- oh. to cast? Boy, um, we fought for Kate. That wasn't just me. That was that was Eileen and, my, and myself. We fought for Kate. We fought for Aaron, for Leisha, who was like she wasn't. It wasn't hard to convince for Le. I didn't mean that. Like we didn't want. I mean, I love Leisha, and she was just amazing and I think the pr- funny and I giant. think the president of Showtime really wanted Leisha. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a teeny tiny. I mean, I, I was hanging out with Leisha. Goes, remember when you sent me home to change my clothes? And I'm like, you know, and I'm. I, there were still things I would do things behind the scenes where I was just like, let's get you in here. I would like look at them and go like, no, get something else on or go, you know, because I had to convince these men. So there was just like behind the scenes like machinations and deals that you know it's just like the the hardest one was was Kate because I'm just like they couldn't see it right, and I'm like you don't understand just allow this trust us and then that was you know i mean and and then the rest is history it was enough at that time in in 2001 2002 that to have 
you know, to have this show happen. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, of course you're gonna, and everything in television, my God, even we were so free then, you know, now it's so like, you know, the, the cast lists are so predetermined. So it's, it's like put through like a, like an algorithm. It's like, it's like, what things are we hitting in terms of like diversity of all sorts? You know what I mean? It kind of goes through the, through the, the, the machine. And there are industry plants. There's a lot of sorts of things. Oh, that go on. it's just, it's insane now. Yeah. You directed 12 episodes of the show. Mm-hmm. I, d- I think I directed the most of anyone, yeah. For absolutely, yeah. you did. Yeah. And you wrote, a t- you wrote and directed. Yeah. That was the funnest thing. Yeah. That was really amazing and a dream to be able to, di- to write and direct your own episodes was a gift that Eileen gave to me that I'll be forever grateful for because that was just, it was awesome. What did you, like, what storylines or, I mean, I have the episodes here that, that, no. that you directed and you wrote, but specifically before I'll, I'll and I'll, I want to go through those with no. you, but is there anything off the top of your head that were things that like, oh yeah, like that came for me. That was my idea. This character was my idea. This storyline was my idea. Well, a couple of things. Guinevere worked on the first season of The L Word. It, the L Word was such a fun writer's room, right? Because a lot of what happened in the L Word was like, would be just our personal stories, like being at the airport and having a dildo and having taken like, you know, like those, those things would make it, or like, I can't believe I'm going down on Dana, you know, like in that, that episode. Was, that was Guinevere's story. that was Guinevere's story. 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 Yeah. Because Guinevere wrote that episode. I directed that episode. And that's one of my favorite episodes. And it, that was, looking back, that's that was the, a collaboration. That was when they go to Dinosaur? Yes. Yeah. With the Bat and Tina flashback. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, with all the flashbacks of, like, when they first got started, right? And singing the, the Indigo Girls in the car. That was, like, one of my favorites. And it was – it's always really lovely because that's, like, I felt like the magic of Guinevere and I together were, was kind of back there. And, and it has – there's so much that has to do with relationships and friendships in that. And, of course, you know, really personal jokes that you can get out there. Um, I think, you know, some of the times when I – I would love to write for Jennifer – Jennifer and I are around the same age. We grew up. She's just a little bit older. But we grew up in Chicago. Um, we're both people of color. We both experienced racism in Chicago. Her more than myself. Um, uh, well, I don't know more than myself. But, you know, like, like we just we grew up in that kind of city, right? Where it's just like we are considered less, you know. Um, and and so it was really always fun. I think we, we both have. And I, and I don't want to. It's my perception, my perception that, like, that character, Beth's character always had a reservoir of like anger. And I would love to write things that would tap into that anger. Like, you know, and so, or her outrage. So she was a real fun character to write for me. Um, Like, you know, when she gets into the car crash and you're like, you don't know what, you know, who you're dealing with that one. Or um, when she, uh, one of my favorite things to write was when her father was dying. Uh, I grew up in the church and, and that was like, that was the conversation all the time of, you know, what's going to happen when, when you're, you know, on the judge, you know, when you're standing before God and he opens the book a lot and you, these are the best, what, what you're saying, even these lines that you're saying that you wrote, these are the best episodes of the show. And she's taking off her eyelashes. And I was just like, I was, sometimes you're directing, you're just like, you get like kind of goosebumps and you're just like, oh my God, like that is exactly how, and he's like, and, and you know, Ozzy Davis is so amazing and Jennifer was so happy to work with him and I was like, you know, just sitting back and letting that scene happen and, you know, and he just couldn't let it go, you know, even in this last hour. So I think what's amazing is when, and, and, and Eileen allowed me to have that, right? She didn't, she wasn't stingy with it. She wasn't like, mm, that's too much of your life or too much of your agenda. She was generous. Yes, she was just like, that seems to make sense. That was like, you know, and those are just words that like, you know, where you can put your family in it, right? It's like the in Go Fish where the, you know, she's like, if you if you leave this house, don't. My mother told me that a million times, you know what I mean? Uh, and my brother trying to act straight in that scene. But um, it's funny. Uh, but it is it is this wonderful vehicle to get certain things out. And and for me, it was like really around, I love looking back because it was really around like like them sneaking on each other and seeing who was out with who. And like, you know, like my favorite is like with, when Alice like runs and like dives onto the bed, you know what I mean? Like, which were like, let's do the dive or like, you know, being politically incorrect with each other or, you know, calling someone a hundred footer or like, which is terrible, but like, it's what friends do together. You know what I mean? Or like dumping her mom or like, you know, those were things that I, that, that I really love, like bringing up having a mixed race baby. I know that that was really important to me uh, in terms of their, 
Jennifer and, and, and Tina's relationship to talk about, to talk about like who's reflected and who is there an inherent racism when you're in a mixed race couple, which we only touched upon, but you know, like, so things like that were always really important to me and them having each other's backs. Bet coming over drunk and her friends kind of taking care of her, even though they're just like, I'm so mad at you, bitch. Like, why'd you fuck things up? And she's like, I'm a fuck up. You know, and I'm just like, those are things you could just write and have a vision for. That's a, that was the greatest thing about, about the L word. I was just allowed that moment with more money and more tools and good actors. Uh, that's no diss of Go Fish. I would never trade Go Fish in a million years. But to have those things align. I think a lot of the fan devotion was around Bet and Tina and also Shane. Those three characters, Bet, Tina, and Shane, all had great moments of nuance and subtlety. Like, how do you direct nuance and subtlety? Or is that just natural performance? What I love about scenes is the things that happen when someone's not speaking, the way someone's face is, is, is revealing truths, and then the things we say to each other in private. You know, the things that Tina, Bet and Tina would say to each other in private or what you say to somebody else that you won't tell your partner or, you know, all those interpersonal dynamics, which can. And, and you look, I know that that's, a, you know, like a lot of people will say that the L words a soap opera, but so is so is Game of Thrones. You know what I mean? Everything is a mm-hmm. is sort of like soap operatic, you know, um, because we have to create drama. I want to talk about two things. Yeah. So, yeah, you actually in answering the question, you actually hit on a lot of the mm-hmm. episodes you wrote. You wrote and directed Loud and Proud, which was the Pride episode. That's the yeah. one with that's father. You you did write the one uh, Loneliest Number in season two, which is the best episode of that season mm-hmm. with the car crash and everything, oh, yeah. everything you just described. In season three, okay, I want to talk about two, two things. I want to talk about Dana and Jenny. Mm-hmm. Now, with all this time that has passed, like many, many years have passed, yeah. can we now say that it was the president of Showtime who said to the powers that be at the L word, one of these women have to be cut. You're close, but you're, you're not, you're not, you, you, you were, you're, you're in the warm territory. So there's more to that. I can't be the one to say it, but no one else has said it. You know what I mean? I'll just say you're warm. Okay. Well, so, okay. And, I'll, and I'll say that our plan was not to kill anybody. Certainly not to kill Dana. I'm like, I don't think that, mm-hmm. that, Eileen and I were like, let's kill Dana. Like, no one thought that was fantastic. Right. I mean, the story I had heard was that they all banded together to, they were renegotiating their, renegotiating their contracts for season two. And the president of the network was like, yes, we'll do this number for all of them, but would they, need, would they need to see that they're disposable or that they're not indispensable. Something to that effect. Am I warmer now? Am I you might be in I'm, the same area of warm. Okay. You did write the episode where Dana dies. Which, which, that, that scene with the flower with Dana and Alice. She died and I died. Because I didn't come back for season three. Why? Wait, that episode was in season three. Oh, then I did come back for season three. So you didn't go back for season four? I didn't go back for season four. Why? I can't have it be on the record. All right. Because so, so want... I feel like it's too revealing of like... So she died and you died because you, you left after season three, but then you came back. So it yeah. was just one season. It was I, just I think I, season. Cr- I cried that in, t- I had been uncontrollably crying that day. I think I was like in one of those places. There were certain events in the morning that had happened the day that she was going to die. Um, my partner at the time had had a splenectomy and the surgery was supposed to be like two hours, but it was five and a half hours. And I would, you know, and that little flower yes. I had gotten for her. So we were in Canada and we went on the search for this. I had written this flower because that was a song that my mom used to sing me when you I was little. You are my sunshine. Yeah. That, that my mom used to sing me when I was little, which is a, a loss because I'm estranged from my mom as well. And so for me, it was wrapped up in all of these things. And like, I, there's a like beloved character and you just don't want her. And it was based on a lot of research of like, you know, people usually will die when someone leaves the room when loved one leave the room and and um here you know and Alicia was just you know all of us were you know it's literally the end of one of the main characters story so it was like a it, it's it was it was a hundred percent a loss yes you know what I mean we're all dealing with a loss 
And we all loved each other. You know, we all loved each other and respected each other. And like, you know, and I know that it's just a show, but like, like it was one of those unique things where everyone was pretty close. It's not like I, I was hanging with the actors. I try to stay separate. You know what I mean? As a, as a director and as also as someone who has to, you know, like say certain things or, or be professional in a way, you know what I mean? So it's not like we were buds who hung out all the time. You know, I, I always kept that separation, but it, it was, but I loved the relationship they all had with each other. And, I lean, um, on the topic of, Je- mm. I want to get to Jenny. Yeah. Eileen had said, Jenny became complicated because Mia was complicated. What was your experience writing for the character of Jenny, particularly like as the years went on? We all kind of like had an expertise in, in, in various characters, right? Like, you know, Eileen would always, it would always, you know, you'd get your done with your script. A script might, someone else's script might come to me, but then it might, it will always go to Eileen for either tweaks or something bigger. And the position that I was in, I would take some of the other writers' work and like, you know, re it and then, you know, like a, a sort of a pre-pass. There were certain characters I think that, that we all related to. Like I related to Jennifer's character, right? Like I really related to that. Um, and so I really, I was felt, you know, I'm like, you know, like would love to, you know, get her that, you know, <laughs> get her frothed up <laughs> or sad. Because Jennifer does all of that so well, right? Like when the protesters are in the front and then she's like has the sign and she's just like, oh my God, what am my family? You know, like and she just does like her value system. You know, like she's so there with her like values and her beliefs and, you know, that, that she imbued her character with. So it was always really fun to play in that space. But Eileen, I think really with Jenny, at least at the beginning, Jenny was really kind of hers in this way that she understood her. I think even in the way in which Jenny dealt with her Jewishness, you know, I think, and Mia had that. So Mia had that as her own person. So there was an intersection, an intersection where they met, but then Mia had a, you know, everybody had a lot of, everybody had a lot of leeway in the show. Uh, I shouldn't say it like that. Like it was, un- it was, it was, it was very, everyone was respected in this way. So if you brought an idea, you know, like, let's talk about that idea. Oh, we haven't done a dildo yet? Okay. I mean, from that to, you know, why hasn't anyone gone down on anyone? Uh, which led to liquid heat. But um, so there were things, and I think I think some of the things in Jenny's identity were were informed by Eileen, and then it's like having a, 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 a baby, and that baby becomes its own thing. And I think where, I think Jenny, the origins of her, might have aligned with someone that Eileen related to. And then I think as time went by, that had changed. And I had never, I really love Mia. I think she's a very skilled actor. And no matter sort of what, sometimes, you know, and actors are very much their own, you know, actors are their own beasts. You well, have. she would improv a lot. Like, I know that She was... had worked with, you know, she worked with Al Pacino on, like, Black Dahlia. And when she came back to set, she had had, Al Pacino would always do that thing where he would whisper in someone's ear. And then she came back doing some of his tricks. It didn't last very long. She wouldn't improv all the time, you know. But she would do, that was like, after she had done that, she had done, I think it's Black Dahlia. Yes, you have to check yes. my facts. No, yeah. it is, yeah. But when she came back, she had, like, you know, Pacino-esque, uh, you know, some things that she had learned from Al that she tried out and I was like no you can't you can't just uh, you can't do that to someone it's like the same as like Cagney putting the you know the, the grapefruit in the face right you're looking for like a reaction that doesn't you, you know we we are we are actors for a reason right I don't really have to burn you you don't really have to fuck someone you know what I mean because that's part of your skill set it's supposed to be part of your skill set right that you can do that in such a way that I believe it to be true you know now you would come back. So the series ends. And- she gave a lot to that role. She gave a lot. She was asked a lot of, and she gave a lot to it. I believe. I believe as well. Yeah. Without yeah. question. Yeah. So you were an executive producer the first three seasons. You left for season four. You came back in season five to direct. You directed, like you said, Liquid Heat, which is the episode where famously Bet and Tina are stuck in the elevator. And there's a lot of sex in that episode. There is an interview where you speak so hilariously about d- figuring out how to direct sex scenes, I guess particularly back in Go Fish when you were really kind of a first-time director and how you would direct the L-word sex scenes. I, I want to play it for you because it's so funny. Have you got any good stories about the sex? Uh, it was all real. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, but basically kind of how I knew how to do sex scenes was like, here, drink this bottle of wine. And here you drink that bottle of wine. Now we're going to turn the camera on and like... 
have at it, you know? <laughs> and like, you know, not do anything, like, to just really not direct it at all, you know, just be like, I don't know, I'm, I'll just be over here did, with my bottle of wine. Wasn't that, and, did, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it was, a, it was a real education to do, you know, like you really get over your, your shyness, you know, when you, when you do a show like, I have to give credit to Jennifer Beals, because it was Jennifer who really kind of taught me how to, to, to sort of like not, and with, with these words, do you want me to have an orgasm? And I'm like, oh no, uh, I want you to, um, you know, I don't know if you want. You know? It was kind of like, I couldn't even look at her. I was just like, I don't know. And then she was just like, well then just say, come on. Like, and she's like, and she's like, she's like just count me down. And so, uh, so, and so I remember I set up like a 300 mil lens to be like far away from set, you know what I mean? And I had like curtains up and I'm like, okay, 10, nine. <laughs> You know, and, and, and Jennifer's like, huh, you know, and I'm like, hey, let's see what happens, you know. It's like, Did they uh, end up having sex fatigue by the end of the show? Like tired of just sick of doing the sex No, scenes? but you know what was really funny about doing a show like that is I remember I had left, I left the L word uh, after season three and came back in season five to direct Liquid Heat. And in Liquid Heat was the episode where everybody had sex. And we were just like, how it all look different? What do we do for everybody? Do we do different sex? And I'm like, I know, let me be a purist. Everybody goes down on someone. And that's like, we're just gonna do the basic, we're gonna do, we're gonna go back old school, classic, classic lesbian sex, end to end, straight leso sex. So, you know, it was a- You, so the series ends and you would actually come back to direct an episode of Gen Q. Yes. Actually, the best episode of Gen Q, period, thank, you, thank you directed. Thank what you. was that like? Am I turning really red? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I feel myself getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm out of, I'm out of water. <laughs> <laughs> Plea the fifth. <laughs> and Gen Q was different. It was different. Different dynamics, different story, different but the same a little bit. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, it's like, you know, it was really interesting because I, I always felt like I shouldn't, I shouldn't touch Gen Q. I should let it, you know, it is a new show. It is a new thing. I was so deeply involved in the, in the first iteration that I probably should have done like kind of like what Eileen did and, you know, like just, I mean, Eileen will always be the, the EP the creator, you know, of the, of the show, you know, not of the individuals. I know Marja was, but, um, but I, I sort of felt like this, it's Gen Q. I'm not Gen Q, do Gen Q. For me, it was so lovely to be back with the crew, to be back with the team. And I got to work with Rosie O'Donnell, who's just like so uh, amazing and so talented and funny and a joy and so gung-ho. And I was, I was, I was grateful and, and, uh, thankful to be have you heard anything about the l word new york yes um it is there is a showrunner on it there's like someone who they set to to do it i think so it's happening it is something which showtime wants i believe they put somebody Mm. i mean you know how the business works it's just like there could be five people on it i think i was talking to somebody and i was saying i think it should actually take place in the 90s and it should should take place okay i can't believe that you're saying that because i feel like something i said to somebody got to you no no not at all because that's my take on it then we're aligned no 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 i didn't hear this from anybody this this is what i've been saying to friends ever since this was announced it's my take on it we've gotten too boring we we have gotten too boring like like i just Queer people in general are just like too politically what? correct. That way, you could get away from all of that. It would be so. It's also freeing. the dirtier, grungier. Yes. You know, like like what were we? You know, like like and I, it it's it's a time when we would we would fuck up royally, fuck up royally. Like I'm showing you that picture. I'm like that person's up with that. Like in that picture, everybody except with the exception of like one dimension, like all. It's how also we were so reliant and so dependent on our families. And I think, and I said it last night and I'll say it again. I think that that is the most beautiful and unique thing about the queer community, that it is a subculture that has that. And now it's losing it. It's almost like, it's almost like, yeah, we'll give you gay marriage. And I'm, you know what I'm going to take away? That thing you guys have that we were all jealous of, which is like, you got each other's backs and you have each other's family. 
And even with the L word itself, the first one, when we stopped, we, we kind of didn't have that. I'm like, it's what it's all about. It's what this show, I think, should be about. It's why I think people love the show. Um, you know, but people loved it for a lot of other reasons, you know, like, right? People loved it for, you tell me. Well, of course people love it for different reasons. Yeah. yeah. What I loved about it was, was that they had history. Yes. That they knew each other. That they held each other up. That they could get mad at each other. I like that. All of it's artifice, right? But artifice can feel like familiar yeah. and feel. It doesn't have to be so performative yes. in this way, that, in this self-conscious way. I think finally, <clears throat> yesterday when I met you for the first time, the headline for me out of yesterday mm-hmm. is that Rose Trache has left New York. Oh, yeah. And that you moved to L.A. Yes. To me, you're so East Coast. Like, you lived yeah. in Brooklyn for a very long time. Yes. And I know Guinevere's in Brooklyn. She be flipped because she was in L.A. for, for I know. forever. Yeah. I know. She's in Brooklyn. What made you move to What gives? Uh, yeah, and this is recent. Yeah, last year. What made you decide to move to L.A.? I believe in shakeups. You know, I really do. I believe in shakeups. Am I am I an L.A. person? No. Is my is do I feel more comfortable and feel truly like I was walking around the fog this morning? I'm like, oh, New York, I love you. As I step in poo, you know, like but or you know, or hear a siren as I step in poo. It so suits me. It's so comfy. It's so my loves are here. Like you know, my fan, my my. Just last night, you know, like after the screening, like my friends were like, we'll have people over. And like we stayed up till two and like, you know, like we're like shooting the shit and like, and I'm like, this is New York. And this is like, these are my long friendships, my, my really, my deepies, my, and then I'm really trying to, what, what LA is making me do personally speaking is cultivate the relationships that I would spend the shorter amount of time on. So I'm trying to deepen those things. You said your writing partner is in L.A.? Yeah, my writing partner, Jay Nava, is in L.A. Um, and so what are you working on now? Um, that is a series called Retribution, which I love and is like a real departure. Jay wrote the original script of that, and then I hopped on. I'm, I'm doing the Bible now. So just determining the structure of the show and like because I wanted to give it this kind of different. Do we know where it's going to wind up? We do, we do not yet. Okay. Um, and then I am working on a series called Unresolved Sexual Tension. Um, That's a great title. Yes, which is based on a Spanish movie of the same name that was kind of like a romp, kind of an Almodovar-esque romp. And so those are the two things that I'm just like, at the moment what I'm trying to do is really have a show of my own, which comes with it, you know, which is like I was telling my friend this morning, I'm like, which is its own nightmare. You know, like, like, but gigging is like great and, you know, and it's, and it's lovely, but obviously, you know, kind of having, getting, p- pulling from every part of your talent would be wonderful. You know what I mean? It'd be wonderful to write and direct my own episodes again. It, it allows you to have a vision. It's like making a film, but a long one to have a vision of it and what it's going to be and how those, who those characters are. So right now, yeah, we have a casting meeting on, on like the 18th and we'll see. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Rose Troche, any final thoughts? I think final thoughts are, I am grateful for everyone who's like brought me to this place. I'm grateful for, I watch Go Fish and I'm like, I'm grateful for all those people who worked on that. I'm grateful for Eileen and Guinevere and I'm grateful for all the producers who have hired me. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm really, again, I was talking to my friend about this this morning. We're just like, we always do. We were born on the same day and we, we're having, you know, like same day, same year. We're born wow. four hours apart. My One of my good friends and I. When and, is your birthday? Oh, it's coming up May 30th. May 30th? Yeah. Wait, are both you and Guinevere... She's 23rd. You're both Geminis? Yes. So the oh, what, so Jesus. little creepy little creepy aside, so when I... That was another thing that, that played for me. I've never been like an astrological, you know, like, but, but, you know, people just hate Geminis, but, you know, so we're like, we kind of band together. A lot of my friends are Geminis. A lot of... When oh, you went earlier, like the, when we were, when you were talking earlier about how like charming and how perfect Guinevere is and how all the friends were like, oh, but she's like, she's so wonderful. I was going to say it's because she's a Gemini. Like they have this witchy, mm, witchy power. Yes, yes. Yes. But that's so interesting that you're both Geminis. Yes. So she, in my family... I'm born the 30th, my sister's the 6th of June, my brother's the 20th, and we're all in a row. And then Guinevere is seven days before, so my, Guinevere's the 23rd, the 30th, then the 6th, then the 20th. So she fell into my family witchery, you know, craziness, and in a way that I took at that time, I was like... It's, it's destined. Yeah, it's, it's like booga booga. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like you're just like, yeah, yes. I think at the time I was just like, I was just like, oh, she gets along with my brother really well. Who's not, you know, like and like, yeah. I felt as though, yeah, kind of a sign. But that's probably like a like, that's probably like the the toilet paper of religion on my shoe. You know, like <laughs> you know, I was still dragging that around, like looking for something. I could actually do a whole other hour with you, which I would love to do. If I'm like, I, can we have, can we sit down and do a whole another thing? Like, oh, yeah, because I have so much. I know we're out of time and yeah. I have so much more that I want to talk yeah. to you about. But yeah. this has been really fun. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. You're so different than how I thought you'd be. I had never really seen you interviewed before. Mm-hmm. And then when I saw when I met you yesterday and I really just saw your personality, I'm like, oh, I had no idea that like they're like hilarious together yes like i didn't i had no idea that it's a it's, a, it's like a real sideshow the two of us <laughs> and maybe you'll get the two of us together but she, i would love to do it's that. a real sideshow I'm, I'm more serious without her but you know like <laughs> it's an interview i have to be seen as like a director you know and a writer in my own right thank you so much yeah. this is a blast oh thank you thank you Everyone, please follow me, JessXNYC, on Instagram. Go over to the YouTube channel, Hot Takes and Deep Dives. Throw in my name. All of these interviews are available on YouTube to watch. And we will see you soon. Bye.